Right. So I'm recording audio. That's for the two of them. Synchronise. Good God. Well, all that. I'm sure there were, there's less setup for a for a pop star at the Wembley Arena or something like that. What a nightmare. Uh, anyway, so um, as you can see, we've had some technical issues today. So I'm told it to stream capture. Keep an eye on this number right here. Just ignore everything I say. Just listen, watch that number and make sure that keeps ticking over because the last one I got up did, it got up to about 3 minutes 56 seconds and then just stopped for no apparent reason without me touching anything. Um, okay, so we're talking about uh, just ordinary uh, animal uh, sort of physiology and behavior and stuff like this in this, this module. Um, and, um, and I'm going to give you a block of about five lectures which are on the central nervous system. Yep. Uh, so the first lecture I'm going to give you is going to be a bit, uh, bit definitions-y. There's kind of quite a lot of definitions, but <coughs> it's quite important because if you think uh, for, for, for me to give it to you, because if you're thinking of a simple question to ask, quite often asking just you know, uh, a simple definition is sort of an easier question to kind of ask, isn't it? And so there's quite a lot of these questions. I think I've overextended my stick here, haven't I? In a little room like this, I think I kind of need to use the, uh, the shorter version of the stick there. That's all right. Um, the good news is I kind of know quite a lot about this stuff. The bad news is I know kind of quite a lot about this stuff. So I've kind of, uh, you might find it sort of, it's a little bit jumpy where I start talking about things. And I think, whoa, better stop there. And then I sort of stop and I sort of move on. But as I said, the first lecture is mostly uh, just sort of definitions of things. Um, the second, and, and, uh, but I haven't got any written notes. That's why it's so important to me that you have the stream capture. You can, uh, you can tweet me questions and stuff like that afterwards if you want. Um, but uh, because there's no written notes, I kind of think it's essential that if there was something you missed that you can go and get the, you can go and listen to what I said about that thing. Yeah. Um, and so I've got an audio recording going, I'm recording it on there, and we're screen capturing. So that's three, that's, that's belt and braces and then, uh, and, and then underpants. So, um, uh, so off we go. Right, okay, so the next thing is, do I, I've got an automatic clicker, but I think, to be honest, it's probably not a good idea to touch anything else other than the bare essentials with this computer. Well, that's, that's terrific, isn't it? So that's the underpants gone. We're just left with the belt and braces now. Um, how about if I press pause and then I unpress pause again in a moment? Gosh, it used to be so easy. I mean, when I was, I'm the senior tutor in the veterinary school, and when I was asked to do that job, I thought that would be a nightmare. And uh, just before I press the record button again. And so, and so the dean of the veterinary school said to me, oh, come on, it's not that much trouble. You, you know, you haven't got so many other things to be doing. And I was going, well, I've got quite a lot of lectures to do. And he said, yeah, but you're not one of these people that puts loads of effort into lectures, are you? I just swing in with a bit of chalk and go, <laughs> that was the head of the veterinary school. You get a lot more of that, you see, before stream capture. But with stream capture, it gets censored. Surely that's going to work if I press that button, isn't it? Damn it. So, um, but actually, yeah, I am one of the people that put a lot, I didn't know how to say that, but yeah, I was one of the people that put a lot of effort into it. And it doesn't work! Come on, damn you! I'll just see if I can just get the actual thing to step through, and then we rely on the, uh, the audio. I've got, oh, I've videoed it. I've, oh, I've got two other recordings of that swearing, haven't I? But you did say it. Oh, good grief! I only put the title slide on as an afterthought. Now, if I hadn't put the title slide, at least you would have got slide one. So, is it going? It's going! It's going! Got the excitement. It's going. It's going. It's going. It stopped. No, it's still, the thing is going, but the slide isn't advancing. Um, as backup, backup. I've got it on my iPad as well, which in theory, with the various connectors, I can play the... Because how much does this cost you per year? I can't remember. It slips in my mind. Um, it hasn't... 
it's still recording. This is this is going to be like the greatest uh, video in history, isn't it? Just like hours and hours of that thing spinning around. Um, so in theory, I can open that in PowerPoint on here. I think as I know everyone knows it's not kind of my fault, but if I was there, I could give us a thing, I really. Ah, organization. Oh, right, yeah, okay, organization. That's what I was going to talk about, wasn't it? <laughs> so, okay, so, uh, so I, I, I usually put summary slides and everything in because uh, this is a, a, a new lecture. I haven't added that kind of stuff in yet. So, so I'm going to talk about organization uh, of, the, of the general system, first of all, lots of definitions. Then I'm going to talk a bit about cells, I think, and then, uh, and then synapses. I think that's the, uh, the ordering. But we should probably find out that that's not what I'm going to do. Uh, right, okay, so central nervous system. Central nervous system, very simply, is defined as the brain and the spinal cord, and only those things which are in the brain and the spinal cord. The peripheral nervous system is kind of everything else. Uh, all the other nerves that include the uh, nerves of the enteric nervous system, everything else. I would have it, drawn it all the way down to the bottom of the tail, apart from in PowerPoint, I couldn't like select a small enough area in order to shade that. Uh, so that's the peripheral nervous system, and that's, that's, all, those two, that's all those two things mean. But uh, definitions are kind of, in a way, they're not sort of important, but I think you need to know them in order to get a feeling of, 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 of the way everything is sort of set up. If we talk about the peripheral nervous system, okay, so we're mostly talking about the central nervous system, but if we talk about the peripheral nervous system, that itself can be subdivided into... Uh, sort of a voluntary system and an involuntary system. A voluntary system would be that. An involuntary system would be what my stomach was doing a few moments ago when that was frozen. Um, and uh, there are other names for the involuntary nervous system, like the autonomic nervous system would be the most obvious one. I can't think of another one right at the moment. There are various different names for the voluntary, and somatic is the most obvious. So somatic nervous system is synonymous with, means the same as um, a, a voluntary Okay. Um, within, the auto within the autonomic nervous system, within the on involuntary, and I would nearly always use the term uh, autonomic nervous system, you have a sympathetic and a parasympathetic system. You've probably heard of these at some other point, but in general, the sympathetic nervous system is an excitatory nervous system. So that's the one that's putting my heart rate up and uh, putting my blood pressure up when this sort of stuff is sort of going wrong. And the parasympathetic system is a kind of a, a, a sort of a, a, a relaxation or a sort of a, or the panic side of those things, the crapping yourself side, frankly, I suppose. So those two parts are of the parasympathetic nervous system, and you can always kind of, you can usually always work out what a particular autonomic uh, innovation would be in general terms. So this would all be like, adrenaline and this would be sort of muscarinic uh, in terms of you know the fight or flight response so um, if you're going to get into a fight you need to you'd have pedo erection you, an animal would have pedo erection it would have uh, high blood pressure heart would be racing blood pressure blood vessels would be constricted but dilated to the to the muscles but constricted around everything else that's all sort of sympathetic chilling out having a glass of wine and a meal and relaxing or panicking, that's the, other, that's the other kind of thing. That's all the sort of para parasympathetic stuff, so gut motion, all that would be kind of tended to be driven by the parasympathetic. So that's just in terms of uh, that. Now remember with the voluntary system, it's not a good name, voluntary. Somatic is much better, but voluntary gives you a clue about what we're talking about, but quite often they're not really voluntary because all the muscles that are involved with me about the only thing I can do this morning correctly, it seems, is stand up straight. And that's sort of involuntary, isn't it? You just sort of think, well, stand up. You're not working all the different muscles which are in, oops, involved in that process. So in a sense, they're involuntary, but they're classed as voluntary because you could switch them off and lay down if you wanted to. Um, but within that, you have, oops, they all come up. With all, with, within all of these branches, this is just merely supposed to indicate, you have a sensory and you have a motor component. So whilst I've put up what looks like quite a complicated picture, you can just see that everything can be either sensory or motor. This is in the peripheral nervous system. Everything can be sensory or motor, and you basically have a somatic and an autonomic nervous system. 
So if this is a course largely about the central nervous system, why say all that about the um, about the peripheral nervous system? Well, in reality, it's very difficult to separate those those things. Most when we're, particularly when we're talking about non-human animals, most uh, behaviours or actions or anything that we're involved in will involve both peripheral and central nervous system. And in fact, you could argue that you would have no idea at all what was going on in the central nervous system of an animal if you didn't have some peripheral nervous system activity in order to measure it to. So um, another key uh, term that I need to uh, make sure you know is afferent and efferent. Now they quite often are quite tricky, and they're good for um, they're good for uh, you know for short questions and things like that. Simply to ask someone which is afferent, which is efferent, and this type of thing. So remember, since I've already said all the nervous, all the peripheral nervous system has a sensory and a motor component. Virtually all of it does. Um, that means it also has an afferent and an efferent component. Afferent means going into the nervous system. Efferent means going out. Efferent is preferred by people that work in neuroscience, of course, because a lot of the motor stuff doesn't set the motor actions. It's not, re you know, it's not really motor, is it? You know, I mean, activating a gland, is that motor secretion? Is that, is that motor, um, you know, pedo erection? Is it motor? You know, so, so efferent is a better term, and that's, that tends to be used quite a lot. Now, I would normally use those quite a lot. I don't know whether I should or what. I just I'll say what I say, but I, I, it's easy to slip into talking about afferent and efferent for me. Um, and you need to remember the difference. If you're trying to remember, trying to remember the distinction between um, sensation is afferent, it's the same root of the word as affection and that kind of thing. And affection is to feel something. So, so that actually, I don't remember it like that. Believe it or not, I still kind of always, with everything, I kind of have rules remembering everything. My head is just full of little simple rules to remember things. Really, I've got a terrible memory. Uh, is that? I always think that, that if you have a reflex, you have a sensory and you have a motor component. A reflex, sensory, and a motor component. Um, and you have the sensory first, obviously. And that's alphabetically comes first, A before E. So you, have a, you always have an effect which before you have an effect. OK, so, but they're different to break down. So if you just think about a simple response, which uh, my dog did for me the uh, night before last for this, and had some funky <laughs> music, but but uh, it didn't save the music. A simple response like this is she's all full of, uh, this, is a, this, is a, this is a conscious, voluntary action. Uh, she's thinking about how to catch the ball and she's computing whereabouts the ball will be and all this kind of stuff. Um, but additionally, obviously, she's taking a lot of sensory information from her paws, where she's standing, from her eyes to see the ball and all this kind of stuff. And you can see that any kind of behavior like that is, it, it, it's kind of impossible to break down the sensory from, sorry, the, 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 from the, uh, the peripheral, from the central uh, nervous system. That's frightening me when I suddenly see that, but I think that's just because it's the end of that video, isn't it? Um, and so what you have with any of these kind of conscious actions, uh, how am I for time? Terrible. Um, with any of these kind of conscious actions, you have some sort of stimulus. In this case, it's like me saying catch and her seeing the ball. It goes to the, it goes, you have the sensory side all going to the brain. It swirls around in the brain. We use the terms integration to mean kind of thinking. Integration is just a kind of way of putting A and B together. Uh, well, sorry, two and two together and making four. You don't put A and B together, do you? Um, and uh, association cortices. Association is another word for integration. So you could say association in the integration cortices or something like that. Integration, association, they're just kind of words for meaning thinking, essentially, but in a neuroscience-y kind of way. Um, selection of motor patterns and then, obviously, transmission of those signals through the peripheral, through the s s central nervous system till this point within the spinal cord and then out to the, uh, to the pores and everything. I, I avoided showing it uh, coming out at this point, uh, just so I didn't confuse you. We use the terms in veterinary neuroscience, well, I think in all clinical, but in veterinary neuroscience in particular, we use the terms upper motor neuron and lower motor neuron, which I will, uh, I will hit again. I don't think it's the next slide, but some other point I will mention that again. It's quite an important, it's a very important concept. Um, upper motor neuron doesn't necessarily mean physically upper. It actually means a motor neuron within the central nervous system. 
and a lower motor neuron is a motor neuron outside the central nervous system, i.e. within the peripheral nervous system. Uh, if we take this, uh, this example, this is a simple reflex. Uh, a simple reflex, this is a, a deceased frog. It's not my frog. I don't do this with my pets. Um, somebody obviously has and put it on YouTube or somewhere. Um, and you can see it's a dead frog. It's not even got a head. It's not even not got a head. It's, it's so-called pithed. Pithed is where you snip that. I'm sorry, I make it sound like I've done it a lot. I've obviously done it a few times. But you, you snip off the head and you put in a, a little wire into the top of the spinal cord to destroy the sort of the brainstem and all that to make sure an animal is totally, totally dead. Uh, it's only really appropriate to do it on something like a frog. I think a, a neighbor's kid a, a, a mum and a neighbour's little child came up to me with a, like a frog that had been hit by a car and it had its like spleen splattered and its guts coming out and stuff like that and said, could I help it or something? So I, I said, I'll see what I could do. Took it into the kitchen and pithed it, frankly, because uh, you know, there, was, there was no coming back from that. That was all went well, apart from they came and asked me about two weeks later how it was. <laughs> Um, anyway, so, uh, so it's a good way of killing animals. Anyway, so this is completely dead, um, and you can see you still get this reflex. So the reflexes require no, all the reflexes require no conscious effort whatsoever. And uh, that is kind of the, um, uh, I thought that was the kindest thing to do, people look a bit shocked. Um, but um, that requires no conscious effort. And again, though, it's still going to require central nervous system and a peripheral nervous system working together. In this case, we have um, stretch receptors activated in the, uh, in, the, in, the, in the muscles. They go into the spinal cord, they go into the dorsal corn, corn horn, and they send out to both the, uh, the, the contracting muscle and the antagonistic muscle to cause the, the leg to twitch in that way. So this is within the central nervous system, this is within the peripheral nervous system, and that's the example of a simple, the simplest reflex, or probably the simplest reflex. Okay, so in a little bit more detail of, of the anatomy of that then, um, of the spinal cord, I suppose I should have colour coded it. I think at some point it was colour coded, uh, but I've kind of changed it at some point to make it lucky purple. But the, uh, the gray, this grey matter is where the cell bodies are, and the white matter is where the tracts are. There's a substance which I'll get onto in a few minutes called myelin, which coats all the neurons. And that leaves an appearance when you look, actually, if you slice through one of these things and you look, it kind of look, makes it look quite white. Um, they, they always, uh, natural native nervous tissue always looks kind of slightly gelatinous and kind of semi-translucent if it's, well, semi, yeah, a little bit semi-translucent if it's thin and sort of obviously it's very moist and stuff. And it looks white the, uh, because it's largely because of the tracks. It's full of tracks running up and down. So this is white matter and this is white matter and this is grey matter. Grey matter having the cell bodies. When you look at them, they don't actually look grey. They look pinky, but that's just the colour that, that I guess if it was fixed in some way maybe that would look that, but fresh tissue, so it looks kind of slightly pinky. Um, and so the grey matter's got the cell bodies. So if you have, where have I got, have I got here? So I've got a, I've got a, a response, uh, a, a, an afferent neuron, a sensory neuron coming into the spinal horn, the dorsal horn, and two things happen. One, it'll send a signal to the brain to tell the brain what's going on, but independently of that, it will also activate a local reflex which will come out of the ventral horn. The sensory information always goes in the dorsal horn. The, uh, the motor information always comes out of the ventral horn. And as it happens within the spinal cord, um, all the cell bodies of all the sensory nerves that go into the spinal cord are grouped into an area called the uh, dorsal root ganglion. Um, and so there's a physical lump. If you, if you uh, surgically open um, an animal and look down uh, far enough to see the spinal cord and you look down, you see these little things actually, uh, well, on a horse, they're fairly big um, and you can pluck them out post-mortem, obviously. You can pluck them out and do experiments on them to try and sort of find novel painkillers is what we were doing with it. Um, and, uh, and that's where all the cell bodies are, so it's where all the, 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 the mRNA and all the processing of the receptors and neurotransmitters and stuff goes. Okay, so, uh, so that's the spinal cord. This is just the tracks. I, the dorsal column is where ordinary touch runs up through a spinal, through a brain. It's called the dorsal column. Things tend to be called dorsal columns. 
uh, funiculi and fasciculi are similar terms to describe tracks or pathways. Um, and that's the name of a couple. I mean, I, I've written up there, I shouldn't have done. I should have deleted off putting up. And I wasn't planning on asking anyone to remember the names of those pathways um, uh, until maybe the, the, the third year. So, um, but they're on there, so it's dangerous. Okay, so spelling out a little bit more with the motor neurons, as I said, you have um, sort of control centers within the brain, and that's within the central nervous system. You have upper motor neurons, and there are a couple of different classes of those, corticospinal. Uh, when you have these slightly scary sounding neuroscience words, they're not as bad as they sound because they're all just sort of, they all say what they mean. They, the, the name says what it is. So this says corticospinal. That means it goes from the cortex to the spine. Um, corticonuclear, that's slightly less good. Um, the brainstem here is, is full of something called cranial nerve nuclei. And so corticonuclear means running from the, from the cortex to the cranial nerve nuclei, so corticonuclear. Um, but anyway, there are two upper motor neuron pathways. Then you have uh, lower motor neurons, of which there are two classes. There's alpha motor neurons and gamma motor neurons. In this kind of overview, there isn't enough time to go into the distinction between those two, but they're two different types of motor neurons that run out uh, to the skeletal muscle. Now, in fact, is it the next slide? There are a lot of other motor centers as well. Oh, right, cranial nerves, right. Okay, having mentioned cranial nerves, um, I do some third year lectures where I talk about cranial nerves and about halfway through, I said, you all do know about cranial nerves, don't they? And everyone went, no. So I thought, oh, well, I better make sure I mention those now. I'm not going to be asking you a lot about them uh, or expecting you to know a lot about them. But the thing is, there's nothing kind of difficult to them in the level we're talking about. Uh, this, what hasn't shown on the slide, but we show beautifully on, on, on the screen, um, is the... I've drawn down here, this is just the more technical problems, I've drawn down here, it looks beautiful on my screen, the, um, the spinal cord you can see coming down. So you can see the spinal cord coming up here and then turns into brainstem here. Turns into brainstem here. And so the nerves, sensory and motor, that run out of the spine are simply called spinal nerves. So um, a nerve that's working my finger here, you wouldn't call it a spinal nerve there, but it is a spinal nerve. You just call it a finger nerve, but it is a spinal nerve. It's come from the spinal cord all the way to the thing. But if you have certain muscles around the face and nerves around the face, and a dog catching a ball, of course, is a, is a great example of it, they don't come all the way out from the spinal cord and then run back up into, some, some of them do, some of them do, but mostly they don't. Mostly they come directly out of the brainstem. And they come out of the brainstem here, out of so-called the cranium, even though they're quite high up. Go for it if you can reach it. And, um, and so therefore they're called cranial nerves. So a cranial nerve is just like an ordinary just nerve, but one that's coming out of the base of the brain rather than one that's coming out of the spine. That's all cranial nerve means. It so happens that with the spine, we don't tend to think of there being nuclei within the spine all the way down. It's an interesting point, but we don't tend to think of that. The gray matter is like one continuous nucleus running all the way down. Uh, but it's, uh, a nucleus is an area of the central nervous system which is full of cell bodies. That's what a nucleus is. Uh, so the, the gray matter goes all the way down the, the, the spine, and it's kind of like one great elongated nucleus. Within the brainstem, there are very distinct areas full of cell bodies which are sending out their cranial nerves. And so these little nuclei, these clusters of cell bodies, are called cranial nerve nuclei. So one of the things that, uh, that veterinary students quite like is to learn the names and the locations of all the cranial nerve nuclei and stuff like that. But you don't need to know that uh, on this course. You merely need to know, you need, all you need to know is not to be put off when you see the word cranial nerve. It's just one of those nerves that's coming out of the bottom as opposed to coming out of the spine. Simple. Um, okay, so I've got a couple of slides, uh, or maybe one more slide on the cranial nerves. Yes, it says spinal nerves, but it's because it's going to give you an analogy to the cranial nerves. But there's a general principle all the time, as I said, that the sensory information goes into the dorsal part of the spinal cord, and the motor stuff comes out of the ventral bit of the spinal cord, and of course this is symmetrical. Within that, you also have the pattern that the somatic, voluntary, somatic stuff is the most sort of medial, 
and the visceral, the so-called uh, autonomic stuff, is the more lateral. So you kind of have if I can use my own terminology up there and read it out rather than <laughs> otherwise I get it wrong. So you've got somatic afferent, visceral afferent, visceral efferent, somatic efferent going around. It's just a range. It doesn't really, uh, well, it, I mean, it, ha it, it has consequences. It has consequences. It has a lot of consequences, but it's a, it's a slightly, it's a very, it's a very structured design. You know, the, the, the spinal cord is, it's not designed, is it? But the, the spinal cord is very structurally organized, very structurally arranged. Now, I show you that just to show you how similar the cranial nerves are because the cranial nerves work in a similar kind of way. You have the somatic, af somatic afferents here, so you have afferents at the top, ventral, uh, uh, ventral at the bottom, obviously, sorry, uh, motor at the bottom, ventral uh, motor. And then you have the visceral afferents here, and then you have the... Um, the, sorry, the, the visceral afferents there and the visceral afferents there. The only difference is you have this different type of nerve in here, which is, it's a bit kissy lips, fancy trainers, really. It's, it's very difficult to know what the actual significance to a vet is, or a scientist is, of this. They basically behave exactly like somatic efferents, but they derive from visceral embryogenesis. So, so in, in the development of the central nervous system, um, the, different, the different stages, different parts of, of the system evolve, and the somatic evolves from a different part of the embryo to the visceral. And it just so happens that you have in the cranial nerve a slightly confusing situation where some voluntary muscle embryologically derives from visceral tissue, so it's called separately. But to me, even when I'm teaching on the veterinary neuroscience program, I just say I want them to know that it's efferent or it's afferent. I'm not too bothered about the origin of it in terms of that cranial nerve. But it only really comes into significance, I'm afraid, in the third year, other than possibly the second year exam. Um, I haven't stopped that yet, have I? Is it stopped again? When did that stop? Just now. I guess it's unprofessional to sit here and sob, isn't it? <sighs> so wait and see if that's going to go. I've got various little adapters here. I expect I won't have the right adapter. anything interesting yet I'm sorry where did I put this do for ask you that dreaded question, Mitch, where are you supposed to be next? <laughs> okay, so that's all I'm going to say about that. So whereabouts are you supposed to be next, by the way? Uh, Sorry? Don't have, Don't have anything next. Yeah, well, I mean, I'll try not to, like, go on, but I, it's just it's if, if I can get close to the hour, that would help. So uh, properties of nerves and glia. Right. Okay. So, um, okay, so I've got uh, a basic bog-standard neuron here. This actually looks to me like I've got a motor nerve. It's going to be dead confusing if I see something different written there. Shall I just switch the screen off that and give up with that? Um, Apple won't let me down, will you? Um, so, um, so I've got a basic uh, uh, neuron here, um, um, and it, 
it's a motor neuron, but the, the, a lot of it is, is similar between different types of neuron. And I'm just going to talk you through some features here. So uh, we have Nissl bodies and rough ER, which are basically involved in the, in the production of, uh, of cellular stuff, just as they are in any other kind of stuff, making neurotransmitters, that type of thing, making proteins. Uh, nucleus, of course, brain center of the cell, and there'll be mitochondrion in there as well, as, as in every cell for energy, as in most cells for energy. Um, you have um, neurofilaments, which are important for the, for the structure of the, uh, of, the, of the nerve, and you have um, microtubules, which are like a highway for driving stuff, vesicles, up and down. And one of the things they do, of course, is they produce um, as neurons will produce neurotransmitters, that's how they communicate with other neurons, with their friends. Uh, they package it into vesicles and they transmit it down the uh, cell. I just see how, how difficult this has been, <laughs> this technical stuff. Oh, I'm going to get hysterical in a moment. Um, I just think I can't even put it all in a tweet, it's so crap. Um, anyway, so, um, so it comes down with vesicles, the vesicles are there ready to be released. Uh, what else have I got if I come around here? Myelin. Going to have another slide on myelin. Myelin is a sort of a fatty substance which is wrapped around neurons in order to help with the conduction properties of a nerve. Nose of Ranvier, that's merely a gap in between the myelin, although it does have a slightly different physiology to other bits of the cell in order to help with the regeneration of action potentials. Microtubules, I've said. Spines, well, they're just little anatomical features, but they tend to indicate a point of excitatory input from another neuron. That's what they tend to indicate. Uh, so you have one axon. By dogma, you have one axon in any nerve. And you may or may not have a number of dendrites. And then these spines are sitting on the dendrites. In a more real world, although this looks very suspiciously like a cartoon uh, nerve, in the real world, what you will find is that you don't have one synapse onto a nerve. You actually have many. Uh, axon hillock uh, is, and so the place where the where two uh, neurons join is called a synapse. They tend to synapse at this end, the dendrite, typically on a dendrite, um, and then they release their ne neurotransmitter at the other end. That's the, that's the dogma. Um, and the very start, where you go from cell body to axon, that's called the axon hillock, and it's got loads of sodium channels in it, voltage-gated sodium channels, to help with the generation of an action potential. Um, so two ways that you can make a nerve conduct faster. Well, you can't make it. Uh, nature has made it go faster. The first is to have a very fat axon. And so a lot of the electrophysiology that was done to understand how the central, how the nervous system works was done on a squid giant axon. For a long time, I thought it was a giant squid axon until I discovered it was the giant axon from a squid. And that's got an axon that runs down the center of it, which is about a millimeter thick. So you can see it quite clearly and easily by the naked eye. And, um, and that means it can conduct at about 35 meters per second compared with its thinner axons, which are only 10 micrometers, which can only conduct at four uh, meters per second. So in other words, by making it very, very fat, you make it faster. The other way that you can make a nerve conduct faster Oh, right, and so, okay, so the very fastest nerves would be your spinal motor neurons in a mammal. Not necessarily a cat. The dog's probably just as fast, it's a bit stupider. And, uh, and they can conduct as high as sort of top speed is about 120 meters per second, which I calculated on the back of an envelope to be about 250 miles per hour, which is a bit hard to believe, isn't it? But maybe I did my sums wrong. But 120 meters per second. No, I think that is right. I think that is right. 120 uh, meters per second. Uh, right, so the other way that you can make it go faster is by, um, is by coating in myelin. And this shows, a, uh, this shows the process of, of coating uh, a myelin, where a so-called Schwann cell in the peripheral system coats a nerve with layers of uh, progressive layers of myelin. Now, in fact, all cells are encased in, uh, in Schwann cells, um, but only some have myelin to make them go faster. The others are just kind of kept like a tidy basket. Yeah. Um, okay. And then what you have is axons. So, the, so what you have is so-called uh, saltatory conduction. Um, where saltatory conduction, where action potentials essentially jump from one end to the other. 
it's difficult without going into a lot of sort of physics to explain why it is that coating it makes it faster. But if you can imagine that you, um, if you were in the bath and uh, you had no residual earth circuit, something like that, and you were sitting up, standing at one end of the bath and someone dropped an electric heater in the other end of the bath, the, um, the chances are that at the other end of the bath you would survive because the electricity would sort of fan out as it goes through the bath and not all that electricity would be sort of pumped, would get driven all the way to you at the other end of the bath. If, however, you had a tube of water of the same length and you put a high voltage electric at one and it was just a hose pipe and a chose for water, it would easily get to the other end of the hose pipe. We're talking salty water here. We're talking salty water here particularly. Um, and that's because the electricity has kind of got only one place to go and that's straight through the tube. So it doesn't spread out and go everywhere. It just goes straight through the hose pipe. And it's that same sort of principle. If you've got no coating around it, the electricity that's generated in the nerve tends to sort of spread out here and some of it reaches here. But when it's got the myelin coating, it sort of can't leak out anywhere and it goes further. So it, it's, it's, so it sort of jumps, the actual sort of jumps from one place, one to another in that way. Probably the explanation doesn't help, but as long as you know it goes faster, that's enough. And this is just a, a slide to just uh, indicate that, that uh, and it's another good short answer question, is that in the central nervous system, myelin is, is laid down around nerves by oligodendrocytes in the central nervous system, within the brain, oligodendrocytes. It's only Schwann cells in the peripheral nervous system. In the central nervous system, it's done by oligodendrocytes, which serve the same function as Schwann cells. Um, okay, so uh, there's various different types of, uh, various different types of nerves. Uh, blah, 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 blah. They're all on the slides. I've uploaded those. So you can have a look. But uh, multipolar, um, in other words, there's, a, there's an axon and there's several dendrites coming out. That's, so that's called multipolar. Pseudo-unipolar, so leaving the cell body. There's, there's several different routes leaving the cell body. Uh, uni, uh, bipolar is down at the bottom, that's easy. There's a cell body and it can go either way. I'll be mentioning those to you when I talk to you about the eye. That's the only place I can just off the top of my head think about that these type of neurons, uh, these type of neurons exist. So that's bipolar, they go up both ways. Unipolar would be a cell body with just an axon coming out of it, but this doesn't really exist anywhere that I know of. What you have is this so-called pseudo-unipolar, where it sort of comes out of the cell body with one bit, but then seeing as that splits into two different directions anyway, it, it's called pseudo-unipolar. That's it's been called pseudo-unipolar for 150 years or something, so we're stuck with that. And this is very, very common. This is, the, this is a bog-standard sensory neuron. Most of the sensory neurons, and these are all clustered in the dorsal root ganglion. This is a motor neuron, and this would be in the grey matter of the ventral horn, for example, in the spinal cord. Right, okay, obviously you get a lot more complex different types of neuron. This is an example of a Purkinje cell found in the cerebellum at the back, an area of the brain important for balance. It just shows it's a massive so called arbor of, 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 of uh, dendrites coming out and a single axon. Uh, it's just that this is a, a, a apical dendrite and it's so-called pyramidal. If you use your imagination, you can imagine this is sort of pyramidal and <laughs> sketched. See, it's got a lot of little uh, spines on all of it because it's receiving a lot of input and this is showing a, 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 a motor neuron by comparison as in the previous, as in the previous slide. Um, right, okay, on to glial cells now. Uh, there are one, two, three, four different types of glial cells. Um, you know, as I said, this is just a whip through, so I'm not going to say a lot about it. Astrocytes are your bog standard. So glial cells are the support cells in the central nervous system. They do the support. The nerves do the thinking, and the glial cells do the supporting. Um, okay, so uh, astrocytes, they're standard controllers of the external environment. So they'll take up excess potassium, take up excess neurotransmitter, that type of thing. Sometimes they will transmit nutrients from a blood vessel to the v proximity of a nerve. They, they're just the standard ones that do that. Oligodendrocytes uh, primarily producing myelin, as I said earlier. Microglia are the brain's sort of immune cells. So the brain is generally speaking immunocompetent. Uh, there are obviously some diseases that you can get of the brain which are infectious, but generally speaking in a healthy uh, animal, uh, it's immunocompetent. So the white blood cells of your blood won't get into the brain. But if you have a brain infection, what you see is, oops, what you see is the microglia all get excited and start to come to life and do stuff. 
and, uh, and they are small. That's why they're called micro. Ependymal cells are another type of support, arguably glial cell, and uh, in the brain, and they line the ventricles. So I got to that point and I thought, but I haven't told you what a ventricle is. So the next slide is, what is a ventricle? Well, woo, the ventricles are the spaces within the brain which are filled with cerebrospinal fluid. So basically, within the brain, you don't have normal extracellular fluid. You have a so-called cerebrospinal, cerebrospinal fluid. I think I'm going to give up trying to say that. CSF is what, it, is what everybody calls it. The CSF, it's the, it's the fluid that, sounds the, that surrounds the brain and fills the spaces of the brain and sort of surrounds the extracellular uh, matrix. Uh, it's produced by a tissue called the choroid plexus. And you find a choroid plexus in the, it's largely produced by that in, in the ventricles, and it produces it. And there are uh, four uh, ventricles. There's two lateral ones either side. There's a third ventricle in the middle and a, another, and a fourth ventricle just immediately below that. And they're all sort of interconnected, and the fluid can flow all, the spirable spinal fluid can uh, flow all around. It's a, quite often it's a cause of disease in animals. Obviously, yeah, it's a vital stuff. It's not like some contaminant. It's a, it's a totally essential uh, material, just like blood is. But if you get some of the... Did I, sh did I put a picture of the... No, I didn't. So, um, so these are all interconnected, and then they go down the spinal... Then it goes down the spinal cord, and it drains typically to... A, to it drains to a vein, typically, that type of thing. If you get blockages here it could cause the pressure to build up in the brain. And one of the ways that that will happen is if you specifically breed a dog with a brain, with a midbrain which is too big for its skull, like a King Charles Cavalier Spaniel. And, uh, and that causes a block of, um, that can cause a block of the, uh, of the drainage system. And then you're going to build up a pressure and the, you can see that this, this whole area is one massive ventricle which is just blown up. With, uh, um, with pressure. Surprisingly, um, animals can have pre a pretty bad uh, state of affairs with their ventricles before they actually die, uh, but it's obviously not healthy, and there's surgery that can be done to try and relieve that pressure. Um, in people, they actually can, sometimes they bypass it with a bit of plumbing, a tube that goes from one bit over and, and sort of drains into the spinal cord, but I've not seen that done with animals. Uh, but uh, with animals, it's more like trying to uh, you know, restructure the, the the, uh, the skull makes them all room. So, um, and so, so that, that's kind of the most common thing you see go wrong with that. Properties of synapses, uh -oh, dear, 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 1148. So, um, in the real world, you don't have, you tend to typically show a synapse like an input neuron and an output neuron, a neuron coming in and a neuron going out from the synapse. But in the real world, you have like hundreds, if not thousands, of synapses on a single neuron. That's why, you know. That's why animals are so clever, because there's an enormous amount of this stuff going on. Right, OK, so, um, so a, simple, a simple synapse is going to be like this, except, OK, uh, yeah, presynaptic terminal. We'll sit over here and scroll through this. Presynaptic terminal, a postsynaptic terminal. Information flows. The dogma is it flows always in this one direction from pre to post. Action potentials arrive. There's an increase in calcium in the presynaptic terminal. That causes a release of neurotransmitter. That causes depolarization in the postsynaptic terminal and propagation of the action potential. So that's how a basic synapse works. That should be there, I think, isn't it? Yeah. I thought you were looking to see whether it was on the slide. It sort of should be, yeah. yeah. Oh, there was a typo on... Could I grab your... Now you've waved it at me. I noticed there was a typo on on this slide here. I'll go here, so the camera. This slide right at the beginning on the one I uploaded. At the bottom, I've, I've copied and pasted the boxes. I've got motor, 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 or something like that, as opposed to I told you everything has a sensory and motor component. And I tried to draw a graph to illustrate that, and I've ended up with a typo showing saying that it's mo that sensory, sensory, motor, motor. It's not. It's sensory, motor, sensory, motor on both of them. So it's corrected on here, but the one that you've got has that slightly wrong. Uh, I'll try and put a note on vital or something, or just uh, tweet me off if I forget. Um, OK, so, um, so in slightly more detail, the presynaptic, uh, the presynaptic neuro, uh, terminal has the, uh, the, the uh, 
releases vesicles. The neurotransmitter is typically, not absolutely always, but typically kept in vesicles and released by that. Calcium is the trigger and uh, calcium is coming in through various different calcium ion channels um, and excitosis takes place. Um, I've got a big, big detail of just one type of synapse big, big detail of one type of synapse, which is the same sort of synapse as you would see in a neuromuscular junction, because I thought that you might have sort of seen this one already. Basically, you have a system where the neurotransmitter is, is created from choline and CoA to make acetylcholine. It's packaged into transmitter, into vesicles, and packaged into transmitters, and it's released. It acts on a postsynaptic receptor, and here is a nicotinic acetylcholine receptor. Uh, there always needs to be some mechanism for picking up and dealing with that excess neurotransmitter. In this particular case, it's um, acetylcholinesterase, ACE, acetylcholinesterase, which breaks down the neurotransmitter into the two components. The, acet the acetate washes away and is just an, uh, an amino acid and will be recycled at some point. The choline is directly taken back up and combined with more CoA to make more acetylcholine. And so in one way or another, I think, uh, so I haven't written down acetylcholinesterase, which is that enzyme, acetylcholinesterase. Um, I must remember to add that to my little decode at the bottom there. Uh, so that's just one example uh, uh, thing. Um, but at a, at a synapse in the central nervous system, um, this is showing a presynaptic neuron and a postsynaptic neuron. You can either have excitatory or, or inhibitory neurotransmitters. So you have, in this case, this is the presynaptic neuron and action potential arriving. And this shows what I would expect everyone is anticipating would happen at the postsynaptic, a small depolarization. If it's big enough, it will cause an action potential. So you need several of them to arrive together to cause an action potential. And if you just have one little one on its own, it maybe it won't. That's called an excitatory postsynaptic potential. But you can have inhibitory ones as well. And so that means a lot of neurotransmitters in the brain are inhibitory. And the biggest example of that would be GABA. And that's a target for loads of drugs that are used in veterinary medicine. And of course, alcohol, which is used in veterinary medicine by the staff. Um, OK, so uh, then also you can have different speeds of synapse. So you can have excitatory and you can have in inhibitory. You have uh, different, uh, different speeds. The very fastest will be that the neurotransmitter binds to a ligand-gated ion channel, ligand-gated ion channel like a nicotinic receptor, and just causes that to open directly. Um, and then you can have uh, slower ones, which will, uh, which will go through a second messenger system before they open their ion channel. And the fastest of all, there are a few direct electrical connections. So I've just got a couple more details about the difference between ionotropic, which are the fastest the, the, the receptors which are found in the fastest synapses, and that's when you have an ion channel and a receptor all in one. And then the metabotropic, where you have a receptor and an ion channel separately, and that takes a little bit longer to take place. Um, I've got an example of a, a metabo... Uh, I've got an example of a ligand-gated one here, which is a depolarization. And examples include acetylcholine, glutamate, and GABA. The most, the most common neurotransmitters in the brain are glutamate and GABA. Glutamate excitatory, GABA inhibitory. And so this just shows in more detail what I was showing there before. And then if there's any logic, I'd have a metabotropic, just showing the same thing again. So you have a receptor. Uh, in this case, it's a potassium ion channel. And uh, the neurotransmitter binds. It causes a second messenger system, acetylcholine. Uh, sorry, uh, G protein, um, adenylate cyclase, the opening of a potassium channel, and a depolarization. So, again, uh, you can have that with a range of different, a range of different neurotransmitters. And in a real cell, in a real system, you'll have a combination of excitation and inhibition taking place on a given neuron all the time, and the balance of that excitation and inhibition governs whether or not there will be an action potential firing. Now, the most common disease that you're going to hear about uh, in the third year, but I'll just introduce it now very basically, uh, which involves where the balance between excitation and inhibition goes wrong, and you get a sort of a cycle of positive regeneration. Just a few seconds left, sorry about this, um, is epilepsy, of course. And I've just broken this down into the two 
that you can you, there's a whole hour on epilepsy in the third year so just a slide on it here saying uh, focal um, focal epilepsy is when it affects just a small area of the brain and you'll find an animal will maybe just sort of do a twitch or something like that was a twitch it's not I haven't actually gone quite that mad yet or a little so-called something like that sometimes it's called an automatism uh, it's just they just do some little twitch or like that and a generalized when that overspills and takes over virtually the whole brain in some form or another and then that leaves an animal in a sort of a classic sort of tonic clonic kind of state where it just sits there like maybe trembling like that and foaming at the mouth or whatever this kind of thing it can take different different places uh, and you'll be hearing a lot more about that in the third year if you survive that long and then I was just going to say this is my other dog but you can't see him really well and I was going to ask you what you thought was going on with him just to conclude and I finished there and uh, actually what's going on with him is he's imitating epilepsy he's actually just having fun okay that's it i'm done sorry about all the behalf of university of liverpool sorry for all the crap <laughs>